peace and blessings, love and light. And welcome to another episode of the How Now podcast, where we talk about how to live in the now. I am your host, Kim Martin Raymond. I am a minister, spiritual life coach, author, and founder of Redefining You LLC, where I help my clients to realign themselves, mind, body, and spirit. Again, welcome to another episode of our show. We have a wonderful show for you this evening as we talk about a topic that is very sensitive, especially during this pandemic, during this season. And it is something that has affected us on a communal, on a global you know, uh, level. It's, it's just affected us in so many ways and we've seen it. And that is the topic of human rights. Okay, so the title of our show this evening is called Human Rights in the Now. And so I want to jump right into this. I want to give our guest an opportunity to uh, really share and give us some valuable feedback and information on things that have been going on in her now with regards to human rights. So as is customary here on the How Now podcast, I'm going to ask my guest to introduce herself at this time. Yes. Greetings, greetings. How now, podcasters? This is Dr. Mina Ali. I am coming to you from the great city of New York. Yes. I am down the street from the UN and ready to just get internationally delicious with you on human yes. rights. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now, you know, she's in my home state. So, you know, I had to get my yay in there. You know, I always tell people, I say, you know, I'm originally from Queens, New York. And right. so, you know, I've been in Atlanta for 25 years, but I am always going to be a Georgia peach with an apple core. So can't nobody take that away from me. I like that. I like that. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, she said New York. And so, yes, yeah, she is in my hometown and I am just you know, happy, so happy to have you here, Dr. Amina. It has just been a blessing. We had an opportunity to meet many years ago. And, yes. uh, you know, it's just so wonderful to be able to, to reconnect and to talk about this timely, timely subject. So let's jump right in and let's talk about how you got into this space of, of you know, advocating and talking about human rights. Well, this is a long time coming. It was in bits and pieces, but it truly was a long, long time coming. I'm a Gulf War veteran and I was honorably discharged after injury. Um, I'm now service connected through the Veterans Administration and through the wartime trauma experience uh, preservation, which is a PTSD thing that kind of allows them uh, to allow us to tell our story and to be able to help others that are going through the same thing. So I love that piece. Um, I love the fact that I'm, as a veteran, able to get back to other veterans that have been dealing with this and facing this. Um, I'm also a newly retired doctor of naturopathic um, uh, obsessions in midwifery, where I birthed babies. And um, by the time I retired, I was at 6,200 babies in 30 wow. years. That's almost a zip code. Okay. Oh, right. wow. So I got my babies here. I got, I'm laying down my stethoscope so I can pick up the tools to teach and educate. Um, and now I am the emissary and founder of the Federation of International Gender and Human Rights. That's through the UN and UN Women, where I deal with the improprieties and the disproportionate um, uh, happenings with rural women and dealing with maternal care help. I also deal with a lot of the disparity of human rights and gender rights, hence the beginning of it. Um, and their violations in society. If you're, you know, independent uh, mom that's on the go, you have all the things that you need and the support that you have. What about being an internally displaced person, like from Katrina, that had to move someplace within the United States that you didn't know, but yet you went when you were pregnant. So now you got to find a safe space, you got to find a safe place, you got to have this baby and then be able to care for this baby all in this one area that you know nothing about. So these are the people that I started with here in the United States, which were post-Katrina. So that's how far back we go. Wow. And then it ended up to being the, the um, DACA babies, the dreamers, um, these babies that are being st uh, separated from their mothers and fathers and, and, and just for the simple fact that they're not documented, but they are documented, but the parents are not documented. So how do you rectify that? How do you put them back together and utilize this parallel of, of transient versus citizen and put them together? And then the last piece, I am still the A number one outstanding. No, let me stop. I'm not <laughs> I, am, I am a mom of five girls, two of birth that I birthed myself, yeah. two I raised um, that are now adults, and then one I acquired through marriage who I still love. The marriage, of course, is over, but yeah. I, the love is so, so there. 
Um, and now as adults, I have grandchildren and I have, um, biologically, I have three. <laughs> <laughs> but out of all of them, I have 17 grandchildren. So Ooh. I love, 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 love all yes. of them. I, I go through a, a round robin of naming all their names and their birthdays just to keep them sharp in my head. But I absolutely love it. And that is my greatest accomplishment. And I do all of this work so that their lives in the future can be absolutely. better. The gender mm -hmm. rights, the human rights, the disparities between the two can be even more interwoven into a, a, a more secure environment for them in the future. Yeah. And so, I mean, even with, with all, with, with the background that you talk about, you know, being a doula, I remember meeting you when you, when you were doing that. So that yes, was some years that. ago. Yeah. I remember when you were doing classes then, and yeah. then, you know, you know, being, being a veteran and, and, and traveling the world and seeing disparities and seeing things, I'm sure, you know, in your travels and, you know, being a part of the Gulf war, you know, j just on tour, just, just seeing you know, lives being affected in so many different ways and then coming stateside and seeing things that are going on in, in our own communities, okay. going on, you know, in, in uh, you know, society at large. And then I'm sure working in the UN and, 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 you know, being able to connect with people on so many different levels, you know, you had an opportunity to tap into so many of the issues that are going on and, and, and getting an opportunity to hear, you know, representation for some of those voices through the UN, but also seeing that, you know, sometimes it needs to be taken even a step further than, than what's there, or at least, you know, partnering with those who can, you know, bring these things to fruition, you know, ways in which we can help. Okay, and so then, you know, we talk about that. We talk about the wonderful accomplishments that you've made. And then 2020 hits, <laughs> March 2020, and the pandemic hits. And we start to see things escalate, even in a way that, you know, we were seeing things escalating prior to that. Mm -hmm. But then here comes the pandemic and, and you know, all hell virtually breaks loose. And, and, we, and we see things happening before our eyes that we never thought that in our lifetime we would see. Yeah. You know? Go figure. So, so let's go there. Let's talk yeah. about what happens there. The pandemic hits and. And, okay, January 2020, <laughs> I was laying in the bed, literally laying in the bed with this cough, with this raspy, listen, with mm. this raspiness, couldn't breathe, couldn't taste anything, couldn't smell anything. I'm laying in the bed. Okay, I got the flu, so let me just go ahead and stay home. And I remember reading the newspaper and it said Kobe Bryant died. I said, what? I said, how oh, he died? Wait a minute, hold on, how old is he but 12? I mean, how old is right, he? Right, right, right. So I was like, wait a minute, I know it ain't old age. I know he wasn't sick. I said, what happened? Then they found out that he had the, the, the plane accident. So I was like, oh, and then I found out his daughter died. Oh, and that just made me feel totally worse. And I was in this bed for 14 days. I was like, I can't get rid of this cold to save my life. I said, I know I'm getting older, but geez, what's going on? February. I said, well, I got to get better because I'm retiring February 22nd, uh, 2020, because that's the day I went into medicine and that's the day I'm retiring out of medicine. That's 30 years exactly to the day. So I got to get better. So I did my orange juice, my vitamin C. I'm taking uh, uh, emergency. I'm, I'm drinking right. tea. I'm walking. I'm sweating. I'm doing everything I can do to get this thing up out of me. March 6th, 2020 is the first time I heard the term SARS-2 COVID-19. Right. I said, what the heck is this? I said, SARS-2, that ain't nothing but the flu. So what is this COVID-19? It is the strand of the SARS-2. It is now 19. So it mutated 17 different times to get to COVID-19. Wow. And now we got COVID-19. I said, well, what the heck is that? Did you Y'all give us a flu shot every year for a flu that we don't even know is coming out, but and you can predict right. that, but you couldn't predict this thing coming out here. Wait a minute, hold on. And then when they started naming the symptoms, I said, y'all, guess what? They said, what? I said, I had the virus back then. They said, no, you didn't. You just had an upper respiratory infection. So when I started labeling all the things that I was checking off, uh, the, the can't taste, can't smell, the, the cough, I had fluid in my lungs. I know I had pneumonia. I know I had pneumonia. I couldn't, I, you know, oh my I will, I wouldn't say I will bet that. Would <laughs> I know I had pneumonia. Right. So I went and got the, the, uh, the uh, x-ray and sure enough, fluid in both my lungs just sitting there, just... <laughs> just watch wow me. i said this is ridiculous so they said well you know we can let you just go home and rest and get the fluid the fluid will absorb da, 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 da. so i said okay and then it was like people after me getting it so i said like, oh it's just this this upper respiratory infection don't worry about it 
Then they said, no, it's the COVID virus. And then the first person I knew died of it. I said, oh, wait a minute, hold on. You can't die of the flu. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Right. Said, wait, you can't die of the flu? Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We didn't get the flu every year. We got a flu shot for that every year. So you know, right. people, then I'm reading the statistics, 250,000 people die every year of the common cold. So I'm like, oh, so you couple that with a influenza virus, we going off the end. So now I'm thinking in the back of my mind, what are my mommies dealing with? What are the women that I'm teaching how to be a doula, how to be a midwife, how to be a better mom, how to be a new mom? What are they going through? And then what about the women that I'm dealing with internationally that don't have a, 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 a indoor bathroom or running water or, right. or, or hygiene situations that are just right. so archaic that we don't even wanna talk about in 2020. Okay. So I'm dealing with this and I'm seeing this as a real time thing, but here's what I was dealing with. Again, above the curve, I'm dealing with the fact that um, the pandemic opened my, the social impact leg of this. This is social meaning people impact, meaning making a difference and an organization forming a table. We don't need an invitation to the table. We are the table. Yes. And we need to bring the table to the people so that they can sit down comfortably and speak. Mm -hmm. So when we were doing this piece, we were realizing certain things that they were coming in saying. They weren't saying, oh, my, my grandmother had the flu or, or somebody else had the virus. They were saying things like, the, the, the school was the safest place for my child to be because I have an abusive husband in the house. Now they done took my child out of school. What am I supposed to do? Then they say something like, um, my, my mother's at home with, with me and my husband and my husband abuses my mother and I don't have no other place to put her. So now that he abuses my daughter and my mother, both of them in the house because he's off work now, he done got laid off. So now the fury is even higher. So now my mother's getting abused even more. So what am I supposed to do? Now I'm pregnant. And I'm pregnant because he's home, I'm home, and guess what else we doing during the day because ain't nothing else to do. So now I'm pregnant, un, an unplanned pregnancy because I def definitely didn't want right. another baby if you beating up the one I got. Right. So I'm here and, there, and now they're saying, she's saying, I don't even have any money to get an abortion, Dr. Mina. I said, wow. you know, what you think about that. She was like, yeah, I got the choice and the option to have an abortion. Can't do it because we ain't got no money. Then she said, oh, I wanted to have the baby. And I want to do a home birth, which is what you specialize in. But I can't have a home birth in that environment. I can't bring a newborn baby that's going to cry a lot into an environment where he's already beating my daughter, beating my, my mother. I'm going to bring another baby into that. But what am I supposed to do, Amina? So I'm dealing with these problems and this affect of this virus in a different way. That virus wasn't killing them. It was what the virus made them ha made happen in their family that was killing them. So now I got to do a lot of social work, social impact organization. So now I got to get into the bread and butter and figure out where I'm going to put them. Is there a temporary shelter? Is there a homeless shelter? Is there a shelter for domestic violence? Is it a single mom or, or a new mom, mommy and baby shelter? What are we doing with? It? And then if she has same sex, that's fine. But if she has different sex, if she has a boy and a girl, where is she going to put the boy if, if it's an all female environment? Then we're dealing with these things. And then you can't put them in a shelter because of the pandemic and they don't know who's coming in with the virus or not. So where are you going to put them? So now in, in retrospect, we're dealing with this thing and we're opening up this, this understanding that there are environments that these people were already in that the pandemic has now made worse. Right. I have to go and quarantine in an environment for 14 days where I can't leave the house and this man's beating me when I am home. And now I got to purposely be there for 14 more days. Are you kidding me? Are you, are you kidding me? So then they want to go and file for divorce, but they can't because the police are not allowed to be in close contact with anybody unless it's an emergency, gunshots, fire, whatever happened. So now you can't go to the social service because they're closing their doors. You know, all social service agencies are closing their doors. Right. You can't go to the shelter because until you get a, a note saying that you 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 COVID free, which they didn't have a test for at the time. They didn't have to test until well into July and August. Right. Remember, this was March. Right. So you had to have a test to say that you were COVID free. How are you going to get that? So in the meantime, what you gonna stay out in the street, you homeless? And do you know that they, they said the homeless population was the, the, the one that had the lowest rate of uh, affected COVID virus cases? So now these women are thinking that's an option. Take me and my kids in the streets. So at least we don't have to worry about the virus. And we got some place to stay, stay in the park. This is New York. It's cold in March and January. It's cold now. It's still cold now. It's like 58 degrees today. It's April. Right. So knowing that is to know back then, in January, February, March, when people were developing this thing, it threw everything off. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't dealing with it on the medical side. I was dealing with the social impact side. And this is where this, this made a big uh, impact on us.
Oh my goodness. And just like you said, that, that so many things, you know, like you said, it, it exacerbated issues that, that were already pre-existing. And then the places where you could go, like you said, the doors were closed. Nobody was there. And, and, you know, certain things can't wait, you know, no. you can't, you can't wait list everything. <laughs> Case in point in Jan, uh, December of 2019, I got my mammogram done mm -hmm. and I'm going in there and they said, well, because you breastfeed, I'm polycystic. Polycystic means that when you breastfeed that the fluid still stays in there. Now my daughters are 27 and 28. Clearly it's been 20 some odd years since I breastfed, <laughs> clearly, but fluid still stays because it's been open. I had breastfed for three years. I breastfed the first one for two years and then a year after for the second one. So it was three years straight I was breastfeeding. So my breasts were like, okay, we just gonna keep fluid here. Yeah. So over the years of me getting mammogram, especially starting at 40, um, I started having polycystic. Poly meaning many, cystic meaning fluid, fluid filled. So I had many still of the milk sacs were still filled with, full of fluid. So if you would express them every now and again, I get a little milk. Of course, it's just rotten to the core, but I get a little milk. <laughs> so December, they started seeing that these were for me. Mm. So they weren't, they weren't jiggling anymore. You know, they weren't anymore. They were like this now. Wow. And then there was another one that was like this now. Oh, so now God. they're seeing these little clusters and that's what they're called. And these clusters are these sacs with the fluid that has now hardened or become necrotic, which is just like it says, yeah. it's becoming yeah. concrete. Yeah. And he saw three, four, five of them in my left breast. So he said, okay, well, we're just gonna watch it because it could just be it uh, getting hard and then it's gonna soften out and then it's just gonna go away. This is December, 2019, remember. Right. March, 2019, come back. He said 90 days, come back. March, 2019, pandemic hit. Everybody was like shutting everything down. It was like, okay, we can't come back. March 2020, couldn't even come back for this. Routine mammogram is routine. So it's not an emergency. Right. So yeah. July, when they started saying, okay, things are going all right. We're starting to let things go. July, they scheduled me for a routine mammogram. Now they didn't have a backlog back in March. Right. right. I didn't get my appointment until September. Remember I said July. Since December. So... <laughs> So in September, they rushing me. Now they get the mammogram. They were, oh, Dr. Mina, you got to come back in. You got to come back. I said, why? Did she mess up? I know my boobies ain't that all that, but come on now. I can't have that thing smashing me four and five and six times. Come on, that hurts. No, no, no. We just got to come in. You got to come in. You got to come in. And they were panicking. I was like, wait a minute, hold on. You're not panicking for a repeat mammogram. I said, what the heck is going on? We just need you to come in. We need you to come in. But you can't bring anybody because, you know, we can't have visitors in the doctor's office. Okay, so I was going to come in anyway by myself. I came in for the mammogram by myself. I'm going to come in for this time. Girl, she sat up here and looked me in the face and she said, Dr. Mino, you are BRCA4. BRCA4 is breast, breast resist antigen to cancer. BRCA4. And you are stage two cancer in your left breast. Wow. Wow. I said, and you tell me this now with nobody in the office. Are you serious? And she's looking at me like, uh, yeah, I have to tell you. So this is clinical. This is routine for you. Are you serious, sis? Sis, are you serious? Wow. You're going to come to me and you're going to talk to me like this and you're just going to just be so routine and so, so cut and dry. Yeah, I just had to give you a notification that you have stage two. Nothing emotive nothing. I mean, she didn't even smile, crack a smile, didn't even say, sis, can I help you? Here's a tissue, nothing. I said, did you just tell me that? No, I'm going to get a second opinion. She said, okay. Okay. Uh, okay. I mean, what doctor do you want us to refer your medical records to? What? So I had to break, you know, I'm mad at this point because I'm like, sis, did you just tell me I got cancer and you just acting like this is just, you know, I got a, a splinter in my finger and I'm just going to be surgeon to get it removed. Like, are you serious? She was like, well, ma'am, what would you like me to do? Oh, I can tell you what I want to do right now, you know, but the, but the Lord ain't going to be too pleased with the answer. Right, like, hey, right. Please don't, please don't bring that up out of me. Please don't bring that up out of me. So she was like, well, let me call my supervisor. So of course, somebody that didn't look like us walks in, male. And he says, well, you know, I stand by my colleague and she's, she's writing her diagnosis. And I said, I didn't ask about the diagnosis. I could take the diagnosis. I've been in medicine 30 years. 
I can't take the low empathy that she has for Thank someone who looks like her in a category of women that are not treated fairly in medical uh, uh, constants, especially in the field of cancer and breast cancer to be exact. Right. And this is a category that you go into with low empathy. Are you serious? So he's, oh, well, I, you know, the, the, the racial divide has nothing to do with your cancer. It has absolutely everything to do with my right. cancer. Right. Absolutely everything right. to do with my cancer. Right. I said, and not only does it, but the fact that she is not even empathetic to the form and the tolerance of this scares me even more. Not only do I have this, but now you're taking away the only thing that I could possibly have. You don't even have anybody allowing me to come sit in here. It's just you, me, and this clinical dialogue that we're having mm -hmm. that I feel like that I'm having with a stranger when you're supposed to be my caregiver. Right. And sis, you're supposed to be my sister. Right. So she, you know, of course she likes skin. So she turned it bright red and she's just like, oh, well, you know, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I don't, I, you know, I just, now why are you crying? I'm the one with the cancer diagnosis. Why right, right, right. So I'm sitting here trying to figure this out, sis. And I'm trying to figure out why it is that I get it. Why did I get it? And then it's almost a year later. And you're telling me that the inference of, of, of having to wait all this time when you knew that there was something there in December and you making me wait till September. Right. Well, the surgery was October 6th and I had both of my breasts removed. Wow. Um, the cancer was removed. I had radiation until November. And then I had a second surgery to remove the excess skin that happens when you swell and all of the things that happen. Mm -hmm. And since then I've lost a total of 62 pounds right. and I am feeling absolutely fabulous. Wonderful. I, and that's why I have this, this shirt. I absolutely love this shirt. It says, I love the skin mm -hmm. I'm in and, I'm, and I'm loving it because mm -hmm. I am just amazingly amazingly different i have a so totally different outlook on life and knowing that cancer affected me my mother had it her mother died of it my mm. father's mother died of it so it was inevitable but it stops with me why right. i have two biological daughters and four that i have i have well five total five that i have taken care of and they are going it's going to stop with them too even though there's no bio, biology in there it's going to stop with them they're getting proper breast care my two are getting genetically tested and we are making sure even in the pandemic we still in the pandemic don't let don't let it sleep just because we're coming out of it we still in it until we come out you are going to represent black women with breast cancer and you are going to represent the the finality of it ending in the family breaking generational curses that's, that's why right. that's right and this is it this is it now i have absolutely nothing to hold me back and i say that i actually have a t-shirt that says that i have nothing to hold me back and i even let go of the bra <laughs> okay okay that's it but you know what you you speak about what you said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm praise the Lord first that, you know, you were able to, to get through this and that you were, you know, and that, you know, you're at this point, are you, you are considered cancer free at this point. Am I am in remission you as are. of this, well, last month, March, I was going to say this as month. Of last month. All right. See, as you want to hear. And so, yes, we celebrate that. And, and that, you know, you know, that, that the story didn't turn out to be different. You know, because so much time passed and and, yes. and and preventative measures could have been taken beyond getting to that stage, you know, and, you know, we know about this, you know, as, as um, my husband is a cancer survivor as well. And so, you know, preventative measures and, 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 you know, early detection are something that are critical, you know, but, but the part that you talk about. And this is something that's so important when we're talking about social impact and, and, and it's, it's, it's becoming a buzzword is empathy. You know, I have spoken so much on, on emotional intelligence. I have spoken so much on, on being empathetic and in this pandemic, in these situations that are happening, that are out of people's control, it, it appears as though we have lost our sense of empathy. You know, this is something that happened to all of us at exactly the same time. And no one person is going to react to it in the same way. They shouldn't. But at the same time, we can't discount how someone feels. We cannot discount how people feel. Oh, it's just a pandemic. Oh, it's just a cold. Oh, we can get over it. Oh, I'm okay. I feel all right. So I'm going to keep going outside and I'm not going to affect it. You might as well be walking around with a knife in your hand. Yeah. Slicing and dicing people because you don't know how it affects that other person. 
That's but right. we we've lost our Empathy. way of being of, of, of being a respecter of persons, and that's something that irritates me so much. You know, when we talk about social impact, because we've lost our ability to empathize with other people and with their situation and the consequences that come from that. Absolutely. And it's it's intentional. I really believe it is socially intentional. There is a thing in society that we hear um, when we hear the intersectionality of how this has affected us, how people with that you had information disseminated, but if it wasn't in my language, how was I be? How would I be able to get it? Um, we have things that if you didn't know that this was offered, like certain clinics in the very well-to-do area had the had the um, vaccine before the vaccine even came out. They had people special ordering it directly through Pfizer for their clinic, and Pfizer was charging them an arm and a leg, but that's okay because they could pay for it. Right. And how how was that? Because now we have people that were able to get the vaccine. And, and even if they had the choice to not take the vaccine, because there's many people that are saying no until they do further research. But for those that wanted the vaccine, it wasn't even available, but it was available to the wealthy. I didn't see any long lines in the wealthy clinics. No. And we on here on the Upper East Side and the Upper West Side and, and, and all of the places that have more money than, than common sense, they had streams of, they had, oh, and what they, what they said, they had like a thousand vials and 12 people. Okay, can you send that over to the lower end so that they can get it? Oh, no, no, no. These are the ones we purchased. So what you going to do with it? What you, what, what you going to do with it? You got 10 people and you got a thousand bottles. What you going to do with the rest? Because we found out recently that it has to be refrigerated at such high temperatures, wow. uh, well, low temperatures for cold, that if you don't keep it in there, it spoils in three days. Right. So what you going to do with it? I know you don't have one of them them conventional deep freezes in your back, back room. So right. what you going to do with all those bottles? So now they do the IG pictures of them going into the the, the, the up and coming areas, the developing areas, giving out vaccines. So what you doing, the charitable work? What, what mm. you trying to tell me? You doing the charitable work now? Why? You got all this excess because you done pre-ordered it before all of us. But then the ones that needed the most, the first responders, the teachers, the doctors and the nurses, they got to wait in long lines to get it. Are you serious? Why? This is what you're telling me? And then you want to know why people have a, a, a lack of tolerance for you? Why? Or lack of tolerance for the system that we're in? Because there's favoritism and then there's favoritism on top of privilege. Right. Right. And it's systemic. It's systemic. Help me understand this. Help me understand. My mommies were crying. I'm getting ready to have a baby. Can I get the vaccine? No, because they haven't tested it on the children. What? So why didn't you test it on the children? And now they just, now they're saying it's safe for children. How many months later? How many months later? Now the kids are okay to get it now. How many months later? The kids got to go to school. So you, you, you setting them up for disadvantage because how many kids are having to go to homeschool with no internet? I'll wait. Right, right, right. How many children didn't have internet before the pandemic? Now they're forced to get internet and don't have any money because the father just lost a job. I'll wait. Right. So what are we setting ourselves up to do in this? Mm -hmm. I I understand that there is a thing that we have in society called a system, but if the system doesn't work, we have to dismantle it at its core. Mm -hmm. You talk about you got an apple core. Well, we got to come and deal with this. New York was the highest rate for the longest time and we were functionalized. We were going on the trains and the buses and we we had the highest rates because we had the most people in the the closest area. We got 1 million people in a space that's supposed to only have maybe 150 to 200,000. We have 1 million people. That's right. 4 million in the Bronx, 5 million in in Manhattan, and that's work and live. And then we got, was it 2 million in in Queens? What was it, 2 million? Mm -hmm. Because that's the smallest one. Staten Island is is even smaller because they got 1.5 million, but that's because the island ain't but this big. Right. (laughs) You have all of these people jam-packed, almost 10, 12 million people jam-packed in a space that's this big. Of course, you're going to have high incidences. But you're going to have even lower incidences of empathy to try to get change. And that's what I was most disappointed with. Right. The system did not want to offer change. It wanted to keep the status quo and they wanted people to come into it with resilience and it wasn't going to happen. Right. Kim, it wasn't going to happen. Right. It wasn't going to happen. And that's it. And then, and then that's where we talk about, like you said, building that table instead of waiting to be invited to the table exactly. because it's like, no, now we need to get the lumber and the pieces that we need to start building this table and, and creating a table that, that we can sit at. And like you said, have our voices be heard. That's something that's necessary. And, and just like you said, we've seen 
so we've seen how how this pandemic and how things have uh, you know socially impacted us it's just been put under a a larger microscope but it's always been there it has always been there it is not something like that say oh well this is brand new this has just happened since the pandemic no this has been going on <laughs> No. for centuries and centuries i mean this this has been this has been something and and now we're we're being called to the carpet to say okay what are we going to do like you said to dismantle this but 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 there have been people who have been trying to dismantle this for years there have been people abolitionists freedom fighters there have been people out here all of our lives and before we were even born still fighting for you know, the, the, for social justice and for change. And then, you know, you talk about gender, you talk about, you know, issue. We can go on and on. Right, we haven't even touched on gender. On. About the depravity of women losing their jobs. And now they're being forced not to even come back because they have small children. I got women calling me now talking about that. They need to note to say that they are healthy because the job will not let them back because they just had a baby and the baby's under five years old and they don't want they don't want the woman to come back to bring that back home to the family. I said, what about, okay, so she has a child under five. Okay, what about the child that's over five? What about her, her child that's 13? What about her husband? Her husband can go back to work, but she's forced to stay home? What is that about? Mm. Right. She's calling me and telling me that she wants to go back to work. The baby's a year old. Yeah, because she had a baby during the pandemic. So the baby may be close to a year old. Well, it's under five, so she needs a note. A note for who? Why? Right. Well, a note from your doctor saying that you're able to come back to work. I gave that to you when you were six weeks out of having a baby. You were able to go back six weeks after having a baby. So now almost a year later, you're not able to go back. Well, it has to say that she had a COVID test. Suppose she doesn't want to have a COVID uh, a vaccine. Right. That's all right. Right. We haven't tested it in breastfeeding. So if she's breastfeeding, I would hold off on that. They won't even let me get one right now because I just came out of cancer. So what are you talking about that you, they have to have a vaccine? Why are you pushing that issue when her husband can come back to work and, and it's no problem? And then there were so many people who were working from home and why can't that even be an option to continue? Because if the pandemic was still continuing and there was a sheltering in, in place, what would they have done then? You know, Manhattan's uh, real estate now is has gone in the toilet so much that they're thinking about using some of those spaces as a live work environment, which means that you actually rent the space that you work in and they're actually going to convert certain areas to have like a dorm like setting just so they can make the money back. Nobody's wow. in offices. Nobody's wow. In offices. Wow. Nobody's in those offices. And the ones that are able to go back into the offices are the, are the heads of, you know, the, the CEOs and the CFOs. And But if the rest of the people are not there, you, what, what exactly. are you doing? Exactly. You got a big old office with two people in the office. Right. What, what are you doing? What and, are you doing? And, and so many of us working from home have proven that, that it is possible. And so many people have taken that on. So why is that not even an option? And, and you have to jump through hoops to go back in the building when if, okay, if you're not going to let me back in the building, at least let me work from home. What is an option that you're offering to me, you know, so that I can, you know, be able to. They're wanting you to quit so that they can save that money that they are now losing from having, they have to still pay for that office space because right. they have contracts. But if they're paying for office space for people that are not using it, and they got to pay for you to be at home, which is they got to give you a uh, casualty pay in case you can't work or because your children are sick. And then with the pandemic, people are getting sick, so they can't work. Oh, but you're working from home, so you can open your laptop. How am I opening my laptop when my child's sitting over here barking and coughing up? Right. My mother, who has a compromised immune system before the pandemic, now is dealing with going back and forth to the hospital. How am I supposed to do that? How am I, how am I supposed to focus on this? Or oh, I'm pregnant. Right. And I'm about ready to have the baby because right. my husband's in off and all we've been doing is being together. Right. Right. And now I'm pregnant. I'm about ready to have the baby. So you're going to let me close my laptop for six weeks? Oh, no, you're at home. You can go ahead and keep working. These yeah, are no. gender situations that only happen to women. Right. Only happen to women. This don't happen to men. Men get now to the point where men get, are, are getting that time off. The men that are especially able to go to the, to the job, if the wife has the baby and is at home yes. with the baby, yes. they get their time off. They're getting paternity leave. I just had someone return to my job from paternity leave six weeks. Yes. Okay. So here's what I'm saying. Now the wife has to stay home, of course, because she just had a baby. But if she tried to return, she got to go jumping through hoops and getting letters and getting verifications and everybody got to validate her. Mm -hmm. But you validated him just on the, on the rip. I mean, you, you, he's a man, so he can come back. Yeah, we ain't got to worry about that. So the virus affects men and, and women differently? 
No, you're going to get it the same way somebody else got it through close contact. So you go into the office, you're more likely to bring that stuff home back to your wife with this. Exactly. What are you doing? What are you doing? So when I say that, then of course, here comes Dr. Mina. Here she comes. Yeah, here she comes. Because I'm going to give that, that emotional intelligence some artificial reality that you are yes. still. Thinking. And that reality is you're not thinking with a clear head. You're thinking in a reactionary term instead of a realistic term. You're sitting here, you're depriving the women who are the breadwinners in 90% of the families in the world, we're up to 90%. Um, and they are the breadwinners. And we're not talking about the women that are just that are just having a boyfriend or having a fiance or, or a partner or a co-parent or whatever. We're talking about those that are sufficiently taking care of the family. That means that their income is the one that's sufficient to take care of the bills. Yeah. Their money is the one that is taking, making sure the food is sufficient in the house. They're the ones uh, doing the utilities. This is 90% of these households. And this is the woman that you're gonna deprive of a job, but you're gonna take her partner and allow him to come back with no questions asked? No, 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 no. Somebody's got to say something. Somebody's got to say something. If I gotta be that squeaky wheel, I'm gonna get in good trouble. <laughs> what do you say? What do you say? <laughs> That's right. And I'm, gonna do that. and I'm gonna do that because these women deserve that. I am a feminist, but I'm not a feminist in a way that is harmful or hateful or disenfranchising. I am for women. I'm not against men. I am just for women. And I'm for the comfortability that you put men in. I am for that equality of what men have. And that should be ordained and organic to women. Not just have somebody with a, that we just, oh, we're just going to give it to because we want to meet a quota or we have a, a checkbox of equality that we have to meet. No, no, no. I don't want to be added to your program. I, I don't want to be added to nothing. I want to be included from the get-go. Right. That means that my voice was a part of your planet. Not just, right. oh, you're going to add me on because you got to meet a, a checkbox of, of diversity. Right. Are you kidding me? Right. I need too many check boxes. I'm a woman. I'm a veteran. I'm African American, and I'm under the age of sixty, which I'm still employable. So just be clear. I I check off a lot of your boxes. That's right. I'm not gonna come to be your token. Mm -hmm. I'm coming mm -hmm. because I'm needed in this space, and I'm coming because there's a seat at the table with my name on the table. Right. Be clear. Right. Be clear. So understand that when, when I come through the door, when I'm talking to you in this and be clear when I open my mouth and I explain this to you because I have no filter. I, you don't have any filter when you're, when you're alienating us. So why I'm going to have a filter when I tell you about yourself. Absolutely. Absolutely. Honey, we don't want that folk chakra to be <laughs> closed up. We have an opportunity to speak Please. and to be heard. Please. And that's why it's so important, like you said, to have platforms just like this, to be able to talk about those things that are happening. Because just like you said, it's not about, you know, meeting quotas and, and, and being, you know, just saying, okay, well, we, we, you know, we've got this number of people in it, or, or we've done this, or that something has to, you know, that impact has to happen in order for them to respond because the outcry is so great that yeah. we have to do something. And don't just be doing it to shut people up. Right. <laughs> you know, so we, you know, we want people to put their, their, you know, their signs down and, and, and to go sit down and be quiet, you know, because we don't want it. So, so what can we do to, to, to kind of, you know, pat them on the head and, and say, it's okay. Well, you know, just, just come down. No. Why yeah. does it have to always come to some extreme before it's something that is resolved? Mm -hmm. Exactly. You know? Exactly. I mean, I, we, we were talking uh, the other day about the uh, George Floyd trial, and that is a, uh, a human rights violation. That wasn't a criminal act. That was a human rights violation. And if I haven't seen one, you know, it's one thing for you to, to break the law. And even if he did, even if he was drunk off his behind, even if he had more weed in him than on the tree that's growing down the street mm -hmm. in my neighbor's house, even, <laughs> even if we had more, even if he had more uh, 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 narcotics in his system than the law allows. Did that give you a right to put your knee on his neck to the point where he stopped breathing? Right. Did that give you a right? Oh, that was the cause of his death. No, no, no. That knee was the cause because before you put your knee on his neck, That's he right. was fine. Even if he was drunk off his mind, he was fine. He was breathing. Everything was all right. He said he didn't want to get out the car because he couldn't. <laughs> right. He couldn't get out the car because the cops were standing right there. If he pushed that door open, they would have probably arrested him for assault on the police officer. So what was he going to do? What was he going to do? Right. 
Right. So when I see those things on top of the women's things, I see the men atrocities. The men are getting killed. Our brothers are getting killed left and right. Oh my God. It, mm. I'm so afraid for my grandsons and, mm. and, and the things that are coming along the pike. That's why I have to do this work, Kim. That's why I got to do this work yeah. because my grand, I'm not losing it. And I told my children, I'm not losing a grandson to this stupidity. I'm not, lo- I'm not going to lose my grands and I'm not going to lose none of my girls to this stupidity. Wow. I'm going to get the wow. best testing and the best variants of, of life that I can, I can offer you. And I'm going to give it to you freely. That's it's it. going to come and spew out of me because this, this is a human rights thing. This system needs to be dismantled and human rights needs to be at the mm-hmm. core of its reformation. That's it. That's yeah. it. Oh my goodness. You see, and, that, and that's the thing, like you said, it's all about advocacy it's yeah. all about education. It's all about being able to, you know, to have empathy, to see what's happening and saying, okay, I, I don't want to just be a witness. And that's what we are mm-hmm. every day, day after day, as the news is coming on and we're seeing these things played out, we're sitting here and we're watching it just like we're watching television, What? you know, and then people are losing their ability to, to even, you know, they're being desensitized by the things that they're seeing because they see so much of it in, in, uh, you know, entertainment that when they see it in real life, it, it, it plays out as if it's just another show. It is, you know, it is. It is and, and, and we don't want our lives to be seen as just a spectacle. It is. We don't want it to be seen as just something that we're, we're, we're watching it happen. And then it just goes off and it goes to commercial. And we just go on living our lives and never address the fact that this is something that's going on. There's an elephant in the room. We're just not going, we're just going to keep on walking around it or walking under it or walking through it. We're never going to address it. We're never going to say that, hey, wait a minute. You know, what, what's going on here? You know, nobody else sees this. You know, yeah. our life should just not be a screen where we're watching things go on, but we're actually taking an active part in it. You know, yeah. you are, if you're, if you're considering this to be a show, then you need to be an actor in that show. What role are you playing yes. in this thing that we call life? Yes. And in this existence and in this space and in this now, what are you doing to, to be a part of the solution and not just a spectator watching things happen until it touches your home or right. lands on your doorstep. Then right. you want to pick up signs and you want to go right. out there and go fund me and you want to start hiring people and everything else like that. What about doing things that are, are preventive? And I think that, you know, the organization that you started and the things that you are doing are, are steps in the direction of making sure that, that we're, we're, we're setting our generations that are coming behind us, yes. you know, in position to take up the mantle when we lay it down. That's or right. when we're no longer here, they they have a space in which they can pick up that mantle and, and carry on for us. And that's where that education comes from. Again, with everything, just like I've talked about on this show in the past, it is a matter of, you know, we, we're going from a space of fear into that space of education and knowledge so that we can get to a space of growth so that we can reach back and help others to be able to get to the space that we need to get into. And that is so important in the work that it is that you are doing. And yes, thank you. Oh, wow. There, there's just so much that, that you've experienced so much that you have learned in and through the process and so much more that that's going to result from, you know, the, the advocacy and the work that you're doing. So I, you know, God bless you for that. And, and, and thank you for coming and sharing that information with us. So, I mean, some of the things that, what are some of the things that you're uh, moving to do uh, with your organization at this point? Okay, that's, that's a great question. Um, right now we're dealing with small steps. We're dealing with, the, I call it the AA mentality. We're, we're uh, doing the 12 steps that's every right. day. And we're, we're making sure that we're crossing T's and dotting I's and making sure that the civility stays in the work that we do. Um, and making sure all voices are heard in that. Um, number two is we are, I personally, I'm examining what I tolerate. Mm. I'm examining what I tolerate. And I don't mean deal with or cope with or accept. I'm talking about the things that are in my control. Yeah. 
The things that I am allowing to rent space in my mind that I know is not of of great buoyancy to rise me up. It's mm. making me think in life. The things that I know are weren't healthy before the pandemic that are now still festering in my life. And this is people, places, and things. Remember, we're doing yes. the AA mentality. Yes. And then the third thing is I'm choosing one thing a month to focus on that is positive. And what do I mean by that? Like this month is the month of Ramadan. Um, and this is on the 12th of, I think it's the 12th of April. 13th is the first day of Ramadan. And what that means is that, you know, those that, that do the fast are going to be fasting for that month. Nice. Um, and it's going to be the, the, the um, 30 days. So during those 30 days, what I'm going to do is every day I'm going to feed someone, whether it's education, whether it's physical food, mm -hmm. whether it's knowledge, or maybe even just giving them advice that maybe they didn't already have, you know, teaching a class for free. And I'm going to do all of this for free. And I'm not saying that I don't already do it for free, but this is intentional free. Right. So I'm going to feed someone every day. And then the next month, I'm going to do something that is something I ain't figured that out yet. But every month I'm going to do something. And in the business, we are doing something individually. So every month I'm having each of the interns, the fellows, the staff and the faculty deal with something they're doing every month. So that means Kim is going to do her mission to Haiti. Um, Amina is going to do her I don't know, work with the underprivileged children with dental work that need dental work. I don't know. Whatever it is that we're going to need, we're going to do or whatever I'm being led to, that's what I'm going to do. And we're going to do it in obedience. Yes. That is the key because the obedience is what is going to allow the blessings to fester into more blessings. Right. The obedience of knowing that you're going toward where you're being led to instead of fighting and resisting. This also brings new things. So if you're going someplace new, new things are gonna have to happen. Just like if you go to a new town, you gotta to travel down a new road that you may not have already traveled down. So you're gonna learn who's on that road. If there's a gas station, is there is there a, 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 a grocery store? Can I get a hotel? You're gonna learn all those things as you go, but you're gonna do it as you go. Right. Same thing with the business. We're gonna learn as we go and we're gonna learn new things and new ways to help. We're gonna still open that table and extend that table so everyone can get a seat. And we're going to put everybody's place card in front of that chair so they know that they were included. Yeah. Not added on. So the diversity will be there. So thank you so very much. Yes, thank you. Oh, yes! I love it. I love it. I love it. And that's what you said. It's all about a process. It's a process. There's going to be some overlap. You know, when we talk about those processes going on and, and it's just, uh, you know, but, but our foot is always going to be pivoted towards moving forward. And not taking steps back, but taking steps forward. Sometimes we may have to take a side step, but we're always going to be seeking to, to move forward, you know? So that is going, you know, that's going to be the blessing. So I'm excited about all of those things that you have going on uh, with, uh, you know, your, your organization. So I'm excited about that. And I'm Thank looking you. forward to, to the things that you're going to be doing in the future. Thank so, you know, before we wrap things up, and like I said, this has been a powerful conversation and, and definitely, I, like I said, I, I, I'm, I'm going to be, definitely make plans to come back and see how things are going for you, uh, you know, moving forward as we continue, like you said, to extend that table. But the one thing that I always ask all of my guests before uh, we end uh, our show is what are some things that you are doing to live in the now? I know you mentioned Ramadan is coming up and you have some uh, you know, personal things that you're doing there, but what are some of the things that you've been doing during this pandemic to, to cope in this space? And again, COPE uh, uh, is an acronym for creating our peaceful existence. What are some things that you uh, have been doing to uh, exist in this now? Wow. We have been making uh, true adages to what it is that we need to be. We have been breathing and we have been loving the skin that we are in because this is all we got and we got to make the best of what we have and we got to bloom where we're planting. So this is some of the things, these are just a couple of the ways. Um, my granddaughter is waking up now, so I think I got to get back. Uh -huh. But these are a couple of ways that we are seeing what it is that we are doing and holding on to that space yes do you need to get her look we will we will pause for a moment if you do you're good okay hey look it, th that's the beauty of this show you know this is what happens in the now we got a grandbaby and that grandbaby's crying and we need to go see about her we're gonna go see about her okay give up we're gonna give her a minute to go and and do that and uh you know as she's uh returning what we want to do is just keep 
and, and be mindful of the fact that there are so many ways in which we can have impacts in this world. You know, not just on a global level, but also on a communal level, like I said, right in our own backyard, starting there and then stretching out beyond that space, going beyond the space of just our neighborhoods and, uh, you know, going into that space of reaching out, you know, until until we finally reach everyone. So that's going to, to be something that's key. And and again, uh, Dr. Amin, I thank you so much for, for taking the time to be here with me and to talk about this important topic. And before we go, please give our guests ways in which they can contact you or follow you on social media. And uh, you know, we'll be sure to get that information to them as, as our show airs. Sure. Um, I am Dr. Amina Ali, A-M-E-E-N-A-A-L-I. That is actually how you spell I am uh, Amina Ali at Instagram. It is I-A-M-A-M-E-E-N-A-A-L-I at, um, in, oh, on Instagram, I'm sorry. Um, my email address is askdrali, A-S-K-D-R-A-L-I at gmail.com. Um, and my telephone number is 347 347- 879-9801. You can reach me. Um, that's an iPhone. So you can um, um, send me a text message. You can also do FaceTime. Um, I'm on WhatsApp. I'm on Telegram. Um, you name it. And it, all you have to do is just type in Amina Ali. And if it, if you don't see my face to know that it's me, and of course my crown is my, yes. my, my crown and glory, um, then you'll see a pregnant woman. So you'll know it's me also. So yes. if it's more than one Amina Ali, it's a pregnant woman that's there on the Okay. So we have on Instagram at Dr. Amina Ali. We have an email asked Dr. Ali at gmail.com and her phone number 347-879-9801. And again, thank you so much, Dr. Amina, for all of the hard work that you are doing and for continuing to, you know, like you said, extend that table for us to come and sit at with you and to partner with you and all that you're doing. And, uh, you know, like I said, just stay warm there in New York yeah. City, uh, you know, give everyone a big kiss for me there yeah. because, <laughs> you know, that that's home, sweet home. That's but it. again, we thank you. We thank you for being here. Continue to press on and press up. And again, we thank you for all that you're doing to help us to navigate this now. Awesome. Okay, and that will do it for our edition of the How Now podcast, where we talk about how to live in the now. And until I see you the next time, I say peace. Peace. <laughs> <laughs>